Finding the perfect resort for your clients can be frustrating and take hours of research. TA Toolkit solves that problem for you. We have over 700 items your clients request, plus you can search multiple destinations at once. You'll have a list of resorts that match your clients' needs in less than 10 minutes. Sign up today with the promo code WAVEPREP2024 for a 14-day free trial. TA Toolkit. It's about time. Running a travel business can be overwhelming, but imagine if there was a single tool that helped you look professional, stay organized, was easy to use, and affordable. That's just what Travify does. Travify gives you the essential tools you need to look like a travel biz pro. Travify is the most trusted system used by over 30,000 travel brands worldwide. So get started with a system that helps you get back to the joy of planning travel and run your travel business like a pro with Travify. Hello everyone, I'm Kim Specht with the Travel Institute and I'm thrilled to be joining you today. Today we're going to be talking about how you can expand your circle of influence. To do this, we first need to become influential. And what does it mean to be influential? Well, the definition of it is, it is someone who has an impact on how people act. They listen to you, they trust you, they come to you for your knowledge and expertise. One of the skills that we're gonna be talking about today is the one skill you should always work, be working on to expand your circle of influence. And that is intentionally networking and connecting with others. I say intentional because this is not a natural activity for many of us. Not only is it not a natural activity, it can be a lot of work and it is not always easy. Now you would think it would be easy for a lot of us. We have clients, we're used to talking to them or even a potential client or prospect. But the difference is usually they have thought us out. Plus, we already know where the conversation is going to go, what we're gonna be talking about, Intentionally networking and connecting with others can be challenging for many of us. It can be outside of our comfort zone. How many of you have heard or are familiar with the law of 250? Believe it or not, most people know around 250 people. If you don't believe me, ask a wedding caterer. As a general rule, people invite about 250 people to their wedding. This means that your existing clients each know 250 people well enough that they would invite them to their wedding. This could mean that one client has the potential to bring you 250 or more referrals. I do want to say this. If you don't have a referral and a repeat business strategy in place, then you're going to be working way too hard. You have to have a strategy. You can't just wing it. Because here's how this goes. If you don't ask, chances are you won't get a referral. Clients don't usually volunteer them on their own. When the time seems right, say something like, do you know anyone else I might be able to help out? Remember, they're thinking about their own vacation. They're not thinking about other people's vacation. So remember to ask for those referrals. So we've determined that just about all of our clients know approximately 250 other people and how we should get referrals and connect with those 250. But what are some of the other things that you can do to expand that circle? Well, you can join communities of interest, whether it's online or in person. Find where people who share your interests or gatherings or groups that have some commonality. Find out if they would be interested in having you as a guest speaker. These types of groups are always looking for something or someone to add value to their gathering. Now, to add value to a community of interest, there's a couple things that you need to know. First of all, you must be curious. When you're making new connections, make sure that the conversation is about them, not you. This is a skill worth developing. 
Also, you must be teachable. Enter into these communities of interest with the intention of learning from others. Your goal may be expanding your circle of influence, but if you go in with the intention of learning as well as sharing your knowledge, you will have earned the right to be influential. You don't have to pretend that you have all the answers. You should be relatable. Humility is a critical leadership skill that really doesn't get enough airtime these days. But when you're humble and teachable, you become more, more relatable to others. People want to be around people who are authentic, are humble, teachable. You become much more relatable to others. You must also be generous. You have to have an abundance mindset and share generously with others. Share your time, ideas, and other resources to help others grow and develop. Share your knowledge and expertise. Also, you need to be the solution. When you're associated with solutions, you will be the first person called, the first person asked to consult, and the first option to resolve issues. It's easy, really easy for us to think, oh, we're too busy to invest time in growing new relationships, but the return on this investment of time can really help you to develop and expand your circle of influence. How many of you here think you are an expert? So I looked it up. What is the definition of an expert? And here's what it says. An expert is a person who has a comprehensive and authoritative knowledge of or a skill in a particular area. I think a lot of us have trouble thinking of ourselves as an expert. I know I do. I always think I'm not an expert. An expert is someone who knows it all. That's where we're mistaken. An expert has a comprehensive knowledge, but it doesn't mean they know everything. But I think what makes them an expert is that they know they don't know everything, but they do know how to find the answer to the questions about what they don't know. Also, keep in mind, in most cases, you probably know more than you're giving yourself credit for. Your clients most likely see you as an expert. It's the whole reason they work with you. So don't sell yourself short. You are an expert. If you still struggle with this term expert, figure out what is your specialty or niche and become an expert in that. How can you promote your expertise or yourself as an expert? If you want people to start referring to you or thinking of you as an expert, it really starts with you. If you don't promote your education and professionalism and the many things that you have done to get where you are, people won't think of you or refer to you or view you as an expert. So here are a few tips to help you with this. To start with, use the word expert in your LinkedIn title or profile or in your social media. Sprinkle the words expert and expertise throughout your profile but carefully and explain what it is that you've done to earn that expertise. What else can you do? Well, when you join a group, introduce yourself as an expert. Explain exactly what you've done to obtain that expert status. Mention it again when you start discussions or participate in them. For example, as a destination and weddings Destination weddings and honeymoon expert who has helped many people plan their destination wedding or dream honeymoon, I can suggest several destinations that are wonderful choices for a wedding or honeymoon. Or when you invite someone to connect with you on LinkedIn or social media, let them know you are an expert or at the very least a subject matter expert either in a destination or a type of travel. Refer to yourself as an expert on your company page or website. Now, this seems like a no brainer, but too few consultants mention anything about expertise on their home pages or even in their bios. If you do any public speaking, 
refer to yourself as an expert at the beginning of the written introduction that you're going to hand the event planner so that when the event planner is introducing you, they are introducing you as an expert. This lets the audience know immediately why you were chosen as the person to teach or inspire them. It cements your credibility. Included in all of your marketing materials, including your business cards, it should also be in your elevator speech. And we're going to talk a little bit about elevator speeches shortly. Now, when I'm at an event, either as a speaker or an audience member, I pay attention when people introduce themselves. And almost no one refers to themselves as an expert, myself included. What a missed opportunity especially when all of the people in the room, well, they pretty much all have the same job title. A little bonus tip for you here. For those of you who are really daring, put it on your name tag at networking events or at industry meetings, those little stick on name tags that let you write your name. These offer the perfect chance to make people remember you. Travel expert in big, bold letters instead of your name. Well, that's going to start a conversation. Rarely does anyone become known as an expert right off the bat. It does take time to become visible as an expert and become influential. Most of us don't have the financial resources to hire our own public relations firm. So we have to do it ourselves. We have to get our own message out there so others know who we are, what we do, and why they should work with us, why we are influential. Being your own PR firm is really about being seen or known as an expert. You become an influential go-to person who others seek out when they're looking for an expert. First, make sure that you keep up-to-date and organized press information page on your company's website. This should include all of the information a writer would ever need to cover your company without actually connecting with you a company description, relevant images, and links to all past press coverages, as well as contact information for further information. If you need help creating press releases, here are some websites that you could look at, prweb.com or prnewswire.com. Own your expertise. You should absolutely use this to your advantage and put yourself out there to reporters, bloggers, and others as a, re as a reliable and responsive source. This has the benefit of representing you and your brand and also building real re relationships with the press. Now, there used to be an organization called HARO, Help a, Reporto, a Reporter. Uh, they were recently purchased by Connectively. Uh, here you're going to find reporters who are always looking for great resources and experts. They, you know, they do have different plans available. You can do anything from free or a paid plan. Introduce yourself to local press. You can send emails, but be strategic. Never spam writers with blanket uh, email messages. They receive hundreds of emails daily, and the only way to truly stand out is to be authentic. Also, your subject line needs to be attention grabbing. Reach out only to writers that you actively read or know that they cover your sector and those who would conceivably cover you. Most importantly, it is crucial to tailor and personalize your emails to them. Nothing will get your email into the trash bin faster than blanket or stock emails. And you know what I'm talking about when you're sending the same email to 100 reporters just to see who's going to bite. Build real relationships with the press, not, not just transactional ones. You're likely to meet members of the press in person at industry conferences, meetups, or elsewhere. Try building authentic bonds with those that you meet in person. A great way to get ahead is to focus on the relationship rather than the PR, especially when the connection is new. So share regular updates, ask questions, but don't be pushing for or asking for coverage. The coverage will come naturally when it's relevant. 
and the writer's in-depth knowledge of you and your product will make that coverage even more valuable. A great way to get your voice heard and your brand out there is to be a guest writer. Offer guest blog posting services to relevant industry-related blogs or look to larger forums that accept outside writers. Your topics need to be interesting, relevant, and helpful, and not about your company specific, specifically. If you think you can't write a blog, there are websites to help you with this. Look at the Blog Starter or Bluehost or blog.hubspot. You need to tell a story worth writing about. Every story you tell needs a hook to make it newsworthy. For instance, 10 ways to be productive when stranded in the airport, or 10 things not to do when traveling with kids. Now you could do 10 things to do when traveling with kids, that's also useful, but people tend to bite more on the not. Create nuggets to insert into your story. Nuggets are short, digestible, and above all, quotable sentences that you work into the interview. They're more than just sound bites. They're sound bites that help you sell yourself and your company. For instance, at Kim's Travel, we show travelers how to get more done at the airport than the office. Or how about at Kim's Travel, we offer our clients tips on how best to keep kids entertained when you're stranded at the airport. Offer yourself as a story source. You come up with the idea for the story and hopefully if the reporter likes it, they will interview you and publish the interview. But make sure that you control the interview. Now to do this, use the bridging technique. This is a technique of moving from one aspect of a topic to another. So to achieve a successful bridge, you answer the journalist's question honestly, and then promptly follow that response with your message. So for instance, no, answer the question, let me explain, blah, 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 blah. Or yes, you answer the question, and also remember, blah, 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 blah. Or I don't know, but what I do know is this, da, 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 da. Also, use flagging. This consists of prefacing your nuggets with a phrase that indicates the importance of what you're about to say. Flagging helps the reporter and eventually the audience prioritize your remarks, thus helping your message, those nuggets, come through more clearly. For example, here's what's really important, or the three points to remember are one, da 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 da, two, da 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 da, or let me be perfectly clear on this, and then, a word of caution though, make sure that your messages are related to the questions that were asked. Nothing annoys a reporter, more, a reporter more than saying something that has absolutely nothing to do with what they were asking you. I wanna go back to networking. We are told we need to network to help us to be successful. Those who are really ambitious tackle the problem with this approach. They throw a lot of activity at the issue and hope for the best. They go to lots of networking events and conferences. They collect and hand out hundreds of business cards, or they establish an online presence and build a large group of followers. Unfortunately, this doesn't always result in the type of networking that leads to success. To build a successful network, your networking activity needs to be strategic and your efforts must be intentional and purposeful. And so what are some of the challenges to networking so successfully? Well, maybe it's mindset. The first thing that prevents us from building a strategic network is our mindset that networking is self-serving. We believe that attempts to establish relationships should be for our benefit. What am I going to get out of this relationship? 
if we're thinking we're not going to get anything that benefits us, we're less inclined to pursue that relationship. A strong network, however, is built with mutually beneficial relationships where both parties benefit. In the process of getting to know someone, you understand how you can add value and help them, and then they're willing to help you as well. Or maybe it's perhaps you limit your network. <coughs> Excuse me. Our comfort level is to network with people we know and like, people with similar backgrounds and points of view. For a lot of us, talking to strangers in a public setting is not comfortable for us. Or maybe it's you're not being strategic. You know, we use the let's throw spaghetti against the wall approach and let's see what sticks. We spend our time meeting random people and hope that this effort will deliver an important contact over time. Or maybe it's not being proactive, not scheduling time to networking. To network. Networking takes time and effort. Be strategic about which events are worthwhile for you. Try going to one or two meetings to assess if that organization is one that will expose you to new people who are the right people. Or we don't follow up. We meet a lot of people, we take their business card, we have initial conversations with them, but then never follow up. Again, be strategic. Take the time to get to know people with the potential for mutually beneficial relationships. So here are some tips for networking. As we said, build mutually beneficial relationships, quality over quantity. If you hand out business cards like you're dealing poker, well, most people, they're gonna fold. People don't wanna do business with a card thruster. Quantity networkers are forgettable people. Ask questions to get unique pieces of information about the person you're networking with. Exchange stories. This is how you create those strong relationships. You should consistently position yourself as a resource to other, others. It will make you more valuable to your contact and in turn to their contact. Also, set yourself up for the next conversation. So if you think that a new relationship will have lasting value, Start building a bridge to your next exchange before you even say goodbye to them the first time. So make some notes so that the next time you can say, you mentioned in our last conversation, you have got to get yourself out there and mingle, talk to strangers. What kind of events can you try? How about attending local chambers of commerce events? I'm sure many of you have done this. Or what about attending trade shows? And I'm not actually talking about travel trade shows. Look for other types of trade show events to attend. Or join community service events. Uh, for example, the Lions Club, the Rotary Club, or church groups. Or check out the local listings of community events in your own area. Or have you heard of meetup.com? There are all kinds of events here for you to explore. Once you've established these relationships at these networking events, then you can offer to speak at these events. Remember, you are the expert. You're not trying to sell them anything. You are sharing your knowledge. And finally, let's talk about creating a memorable elevator speech. So for those of you who aren't sure what this even is, what's an elevator speech? Well, an elevator speech is a quick synopsis of your background and experience. The reason it's called an elevator speech is that it should be short enough to present it during a brief elevator ride. This speech is all about you, who you are, and what you do. Your elevator speech is a way to share your expertise and credentials quickly and effectively with people who don't know you. When it's done right, it can help you introduce yourself to business connections in a compelling way, and it can help you build your network. Your elevator speech needs to be brief, no more than 30 to 60 seconds. You don't need to include your entire life story. Your pitch should be a short recap of who you are and what you do. You should be persuasive. So even though it's short, your speech should be 
compelling enough to spark the listener's interest in you and your business. Your elevator pitch should explain who you are, what qualifications, and what skills you have. Try to focus on assets that add value in many situations. Most importantly, you need to practice, practice, practice. The best way to get comfortable about giving an elevator speech is to practice it until the speed and pitch come naturally without sounding robotic. The more you practice, the easier it will be to deliver it. Practice giving your speech to a friend or recording it. This will help you know whether you're keeping it within the time limit and giving a coherent message. I do have some don'ts for you. First one is don't speak too fast. Yes, you only have a short time to convey a lot of information, but don't try to fix that by speaking quickly. This will only make it hard for listeners to absorb your message. Avoid rambling. This is why it is so important to practice your pitch. While you don't want to over rehearse it to the point that you sound like a commercial, you also don't want to have it unfocused or unclear sentences in your speech or have it get off track. You need to be able to give it to the person that you're talking. You also need to be able to give the person you're talking to an opportunity to interject or respond. Make sure to modulate your voice to keep your listener interested. Also, remember your face. Keep your facial expression friendly and don't forget to smile. Sometimes we're so busy thinking about what we have to say, we forget what our face is doing. Also, don't have just one elevator speech. You want to be able to customize your speech depending on who you're speaking to. What should you include? Start with your name, your company, your title, and then talk about what you do and for whom and the problem you can help solve or help with. The idea isn't to tell your whole story or every detail, but rather to convey the essence of what it is you do, i.e. travel planning, uh, for whom, who is your target market, and then sprinkle in a few words or phrases that are going to pique their interest and prompt further questions or conversation. The other thing that goes along with your elevator pitch is your why story. Why you do what you do. Was there an aha moment or a flash of inspiration? Or maybe there was a time you were frustrated that your own problem wasn't being solved by anyone else. Or maybe you thought you could do it better. This is your why. And it should be the story that you share with others. Sharing your why story, being authentic and honest is a tried and true way to build that important no like trust factor. Your why story can be slightly longer than your elevator speech, but like the elevator speech, it should also be succinct. Telling your why story is a great way to introduce yourself either to a person or to an audience. Typically, we introduce ourselves by starting with our name, our title, and the name of our business. But you need to capture your audience attention, whether that be a group of people or just one single person from that very first sentence. If you can start your why story from a point of conflict, which is usually the most interesting part of the story, it will hook your listeners' attention. They'll be all ears during your story. Now, you might be thinking, my why story has no point of conflict. Now what? That's okay. Or maybe you're not sure how to tell your story or what to include. Start by making a list of all the things that make you unique. What are the special highlights of your life or the events that shaped you to be the person that you are today? And then weave all of those separate pieces into a story that is attention grabbing and compelling and in some way inspirational or motivational. Remember, it's important not only to deliver the essential information, but also to grab and hold their attention. Try to sprinkle in some intriguing words or phrases to keep your listeners engaged and or to arouse their interest. 
Remember, both your why story and your elevator speech are works in progress and they require practice and they will evolve and change over time. I wanna thank you for joining me today. And because the Travel Institute is celebrating its 60th anniversary this year, we wanna give you a very special promotion. Our premium access library is filled with a variety of courses, including our specialty and niche courses, such as our new luxury specialist course and our brand new group specialist course, as well as many, many others. We also have our destination specialist course of libraries, including our brand new Netherlands specialist course and our new Vietnam course. Now, in addition to all of these uh, specialist courses, you also have access to all of our educational recorded webinars. So please visit the travelinstitute.com and check out the premium access library. Use the code to receive 15% off the price of premium, premium access. Again, I wanna thank you for joining me today and have a great one. Yeah.